new details about the FBI's Stingray. That's the cell phone interception device that captures signals, location, cell phone data. This all started coming out after two U.S. senators launched a full ins investigation to learn how the FBI uses this Stingray device. During their investigation, they discovered the FBI completely disregards personal privacy in public places. Now, this device is very powerful. It can capture massive amounts of data from cell phones out in public, and it can't really screen out the rest of those law-abiding citizens in the radius. It captures all the cell phones in its reach. Now, the FBI says they only use this Stingray in specific instances, when someone's life is on the line, they say. But that criteria is a very gray area. For instance, up in Chicago, police scanner audio records indicate last month they were actually using one of these Stingray devices to track phone calls from a person protesting violent police. In Washington State, a police department used the Stingray device to investigate crimes after they had already happened and even tried to use it to track down a missing laptop. Now, Republican Senator Chuck Grassley and Democrat Patrick Leahy are pressing the FBI to clarify the exact legal basis for sweeping up private data without a warrant. And in other Congress news, with the most diverse Congress in U.S. history poised to take charge in Washington, there really isn't much room for any kind of political misstep. And yet new reports from several publications slamming Louisiana Republican Steve Scalise for a speech he gave more than a dozen years ago, Scalise now serves as the House Majority Whip in the GOP, and he's up for renomination to still fill that position. But in order to do that, he'll have to overcome a barrage of negative press. In 2002, Scalise admits he spoke to a group of people in Louisiana with ties to the KKK. Now, Scalise says he didn't know who was actually in attendance, and he was just trying to speak about new ideas and policies he had to improve the state to anyone who would listen. Politico now calls Scalise damaged goods, toxic. The Washington Post labeled Scalise's week the worst week in Washington. It's been a firestorm for him recently. Even the White House piled on through President Obama's mouthpiece, Press Secretary Josh Earnest. He warned GOP lawmakers about what it might mean if they reelect Scalise to a position of prominence. About how Republicans need to broaden their appeal to young people and to women to gays and to minorities, that the success of their party will depend on their ability to broaden that outreach. Now, Ernest went on to compare Scalise to David Duke, a former grand wizard in the Ku Klux Klan himself. He says if the GOP nominates Scalise to remain House Majority Whip, it would say, quote, a lot about Republican values, essentially calling the entire Republican Party racist if they keep Scalise in that position. But not everybody agrees with him. Mia Love, the first black Republican woman ever elected to Congress, backs Scalise. She says he's done a great deal to help her personally in her professional career. And black Democrat Congressman Cedric Richmond also supports Scalise. During a recent interview, Richmond said he doesn't think Scalise has a racist bone in his body. And this isn't the first time the White House has stirred racial tensions either through the president's official spokesman or instead through one of his biggest fundraisers, Al Sharpton. Activist and Reverend Al Sharpton's financial indiscretions have been widely reported in recent days, but now the New York Post is calling Sharpton out for wielding threats against big corporations in exchange for big payouts. National Legal and Policy Center Chairman Ken Boehm says Al Sharpton has enriched himself and the National Action Network for years by threatening companies with bad publicity if they didn't come to terms with him. Put simply, Sharpton specializes in shakedowns. The report suggests that's probably what happened recently when Sony executive Amy Pascal was seen recently leaving a closed door meeting at a hotel with Har uh, Sharpton. That's where witnesses say Sharpton put her through one of those shakedowns. Now in New York, the ties get even more political. Sharpton often brags about his personal connection to Mayor Bill de Blasio. And in a recent state inspector general report, Sharpton's name came up a few times with ties to a casino Coming to New York, Plainfield Asset Management was a company that paid half a million dollars to a nonprofit called Education Reform Now. That seems fair by itself. But then that third party turned around and gave all that money, $500,000, right to Sharpton's group NAN. While Plainfield swore the donation was intended to pro promote educational equality, they were also at the same time in a bidding war for that horse racing track in Queens. Now, two years later, Plainfield had gone under, and a new company emerged. That company, AEG, also with ties and donations to Sharpton, 
did in fact get the bid for the racetrack. They got help from the, the government there. Now, until this point, Sharpton has managed to stay about two to four years ahead of those alleged indiscretions and all these accusations. But now with each new report coming out, more Americans are growing skeptical of his shady tactics and want to know more about specifically how he's being used to pressure corporations into political situations. Moving on now, the new GOP-controlled Congress kicks things off Tuesday morning. One big item on the agenda right out of the gates, the Keystone XL pipeline. We heard a lot about this back in November. You might remember when two Louisiana senators were jockeying for a position for one seat. The House approved the bill and sent it off to the Senate, but that's where it died, by just one vote. Now, even with a Democratic majority, it almost passed through to the president's desk. Now, with the Republicans in strong command of both chambers in Congress, the Keystone Pipeline bill will almost certainly make its way to the president's desk. Now, whether or not he'll sign it, that's a different story. The president says he needs to see more environmental research before he signs it into action. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the pipeline would translate into thousands of new jobs for Americans. In other news, the largest police union in the entire country urges President Obama to grant them special protection. It's a group of 300,000 police officers. That's more armed officers than the entire active Syrian army. And they want the executive branch to label them a protected class covered under federal hate crime statutes. Since 1969, when the first hate crime law was passed into action, several times it's been expanded to include things like race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and those people with disabilities. It's a hate crime to act against those people for their class or for their status. Now, police officers want to include a badge and uniform to that list. They want the chance to prosecute anyone who attacks a police officer with increased penalties up to an extra 10 years in jail. And that's not all. In their recent press release, the FOP union admits they supported a law last year that would include the death penalty for anyone who attempted to murder a law enforcement officer at any level. Attempted murder. Now, different states have various levels of penalties for that crime, but right now the federal penalty is set between 6 and 14 years in jail. The police union would extend that to the death penalty. Two plainclothes New York City police officers in critical but stable position after a condition rather being shot while responding to a robbery in the Bronx. A manhunt underway for two suspects. One officer was shot in the left arm and the lower back, the other in the left arm and the chest. Now, police commissioner Bill Bratton says one of the robbery suspects fired first, forcing police officers to fire back. These shootings, of course, come just a couple weeks after two other New York City officers were ambushed and executed as they sat in their squad car. Now, some officers have accused Mayor Bill de Blasio of creating an anti-police climate in the city, many of them turning their backs on him to show their disapproval even at the funerals of those two police officers. Now, for the first time, de Blasio finally spoke up on the matter of those police officers turning their back, and he doesn't approve of the protest. They were disrespectful to the families involved. That's the bottom line. They were disrespectful to the families who had lost their loved one. And uh, I can't understand why anyone would do such a thing in a context like that. New York City police officers have said recently de Blasio has blood on his hands for supporting anti-police sentiment leading up to the recent ambush killing. And elsewhere, four and a half million dollars. That's how much it would cost for a 30 second commercial in the Super Bowl this year. And from what we're hearing from Madison Avenue, the advertisers there, the game is essentially already sold out. Big demand this year. Companies like Skittles, Carnival, even Moxie, all looking to get some exposure during the most watched TV event of the year. As you can imagine, there will be no shortage of celebrities, stunts, technology, and I'm sure we'll see a lot of creativity in those ad spots.